welcome back. And we are excited to bring to you the next panel discussion for today, which will focus on the practicality of scaling up for larger patient populations. Now, in this session, we'll be taking a very familiar challenge and putting it under the microscope, how to prepare your manufacturing operations for larger production. The need for scale up is a fast approaching reality for many in advanced therapeutic, advanced therapies at the moment. And a pathway to success is often riddled with a lack of available solutions. So the aim of the panel will be to provide practical, actionable advice to biotechs who are looking to scale up. Now, this session is brought to you by Scale Ready, the joint venture of Biotechni, Fresenius Kabi and Wilson Wolf, bringing you the most simple, scalable and versatile manufacturing platform in the industry. And they will be joined by experts from Marker Therapeutics, Neurix Therapeutics and Imatics. So with all of that, it's over to our moderator for this panel, Josh Ludwig. Josh. Thank you, David. Uh, appreciate the introduction. And um, thank you to the organizers facilitate for putting this digital event on. We're excited to be uh, a part of this uh, event and, and having this discussion. I think it's gonna be a worthwhile discussion. Um, again, what are we gonna focus on here? We wanna focus on uh, the practicality for scaling up uh, and then the actual process for scaling out to larger patient populations. Thankfully, I have a, a team of uh, established experts in the field that have experience both in, in academic settings and taking their uh, clinical work into uh, industry settings. I'm gonna do a brief uh, round of introductions to the folks on the call, and then they're going to uh, give everybody an overview of, of what their companies are up to today. And then we'll get into um, a fun roundtable discussion uh, followed by the, the final 10 minutes or so of, of this session, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So please feel free to uh, get in the chat and, and ask any of us and all of us uh, the questions that are on your mind. Okay, so first on my screen, uh, Dr. Mamta Karla. Um, she earned her PhD in immunology from the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Punjab. She then worked as a postdoc researcher at Oklahoma State and Laureate Institute for Brain Research. And finally, she was a postdoc associate at Baylor College of Medicine before transitioning to industry where she's now the uh, CMC, the director of CMC at Amatix. Um, again, Amatix is, and she'll get into this, working on both autologous and allogeneic uh, TCR T cell candidates. Um, next on the screen, I have Dr. Michael Lotz, uh, a, a true pioneer in the cell therapy industry, if, if, uh, if you'll allow me say it, to say that, Michael. Uh, he actually started working on the first cell therapy in 1980 um, and completed his postdoc training at the, N at the NCI under Dr. Steven Rosenberg. Um, he was then working on the first gene therapies and cytokine therapies also at the NIH. And I think it was at that time Michael, you've told me that you really realized that there was a lot of hard work ahead to, to really meld this into an industry that we now have today with cell therapy. Uh, you trained as a, a, a surgeon at University of Rochester and finally transitioned to industry with, with several positions, but you were the chief scientific officer at then Lion Biotechnologies, now Iovance, and uh, now you're the world's first chief cell therapy officer uh, love the title, at Nurix Therapeutics. So Nurix is focused on drug-enhanced TIL and drug-enhanced CAR-T programs using their proprietary targeted protein technology. I'm sure Michael will, will get into that. Uh, finally, um, I have Dr. Juan Vera, somebody with uh, a whole lot of deep knowledge in both academic and, and industry clinical settings. So Dr. Vera is a medical surgeon by training, hailing from Columbia. And at Baylor, he was a postdoc within an immunotherapy fellowship program at the Cell and Gene Therapy Center, where he worked under Dr. Malcolm Brenner. Uh, Dr. Vera was then promoted and, and had his own lab uh, as an associate professor, where he really began working to simplify manufacturing process of T-cell therapies. So from there, um, Dr. Vera has, has made his way into the industry by founding uh, Alovir um, and, and, and working on that venture, which was focused on uh, the promise of allogeneic uh, 
virus specific T cells. And, and now he is actually the chief scientific officer and he was a founding member of Marker Therapeutics, which is focused on tumor specific T cells, um, both for allogeneic and, and, and autologous. So, so very interesting um, uh, areas that, that each of you are focused on, very different uh, in, in this broad field of cell therapy. Um, I will now hand it over to Mamta uh, to, to give a, a, a better introduction to what, what is going on at Amatix. Thank you, Josh. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be the part of this panel um, on scaling up the manufacturing process for cellular therapies. Uh, and regarding Amatix, we are a TCRT company with the uh, goal to unlock immunotherapies for treatment of solid cancers. So, Emadix has end-to-end -end capabilities and starting from target discovery and validation platform. Uh, this is a proprietary platform uh, called Expresident. Then this know-how of the target peptides is further developed into uh, the acceptor of using acceptor platform into the identification and engineering of TCRs that recognize these specific uh, peptide HLA complexes um, expressed on uh, selectively on the tumors as compared to the normal tissues. And using ExPresident platform, the selection of very safe targets is now then further translated into two distinct uh, product modalities, uh, adoptive cell therapies or <clears throat> the TCR by specifics. Uh, so I'll be focusing on adoptive cell therapies today where we have uh, various autologous as well as allogeneic programs autologous programs for Emmatix, um, three of them are already in the clinical pipeline for phase one clinical trial. And today I'll be sharing some of the experience that we have gathered during the process development uh, for these autologous programs and um, some experience that we are now collecting as we are developing our preclinical pipeline for an allogeneic product. Um, I will now pass it to um, Dr. Michael Lotz to introduce Nurex and so, moving on to the slides. There we go. So Josh and uh, panelists, it's really a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm uh, currently in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but divide my time up uh, between the home offices of Nurex Therapeutics, which is a now publicly traded company in San Francisco, uh, headquartered in San Francisco, and a process development group that we've created here in, in Pittsburgh. And before I begin, I'd like to remind you that my comments and responses to our questions reflect my views only and are not those necessarily of Nurex or its management or the board of directors. And uh, although some of my statements today may be related to Nurex, the actual candidates and businesses that are forward looking under federal security laws, given we're, we're a publicly traded company, um, and so uh, actual results, as is true for all forward-looking statements due to risks and uncertainties associated with NERX's business exists. And if you want to have any additional details, you can refer to our SEC finalists. Um, so finally, any statements I may make about NERX or product candidates or our business are not intended to contradict or modify any of our existing public uh, disclosures. And that was uh, a statement that I think is fair probably for all of us uh, to make. Maybe I can go to the next slide and I can introduce uh, Nurex more formally. Uh, fundamentally, uh, Nurex is a um, uh, E3 ligase company uh, focused on small molecule drug development, uh, primarily uh, designed to either uh, use the power in E3 ligases to uh, harness them to uh, target molecules to decrease uh, proteins in the cell. The alternative is to, um, is to actually inhibit these E3 ligases to increase uh, proteins in the cell. And we've uh, disclosed that we're bringing three small molecule drugs into the clinic this year at, uh, at Nurex. Uh, but the one I'd like to focus on today 
and uh, be happy to uh, go in a little bit more detail, is to use small molecule drugs that may modify cells during the cell manufacturing process. And um, uh, the particular one that we've been working on is a civil B inhibitor, uh, which is uh, uh, has picomolar and anamolar affinity, and we can use that uh, both as an agent to enhance uh, cell growth. And you can see uh, Josh's Wilson Wolf flask at the bottom of our uh, culture period there. Um, or you can um, add the small molecule drug orally, and, and we're advancing this both in uh, the setting of CAR T cells as well as autologous tumor infiltrating uh, lymphocytes. And uh, just uh, lastly, as uh, Josh mentioned, I've been in this business quite a long while, uh, going back uh, quite a few years. And it's been absolutely astonishing to me how uh, the field has now adopted our T cell therapeutics and just to remind the audience that we're not going to cure cancer without T cells. I'll pass it over to, to, to Juan. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Nanta. That was actually great. If, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. And I will copy Michael's a, a statement. Market is also a, a public company. And for additional information, please, I will refer you to the Marker website for any Fort Lucan statements related to the company. Um, Marker Therapeutics is an early stage biotech company that has licensed the technology from Baylor College of Medicine. And I would like to characterize Marker as a um, very interesting early stage biotech company because it relies in a large data, clinical data set from Baylor. So at Baylor, we have treated over 150 patients with this technology, that it is a multi-antigen, multi-epitope T-cell therapy. And now the purpose of marker therapeutics is to advance this therapy forward and allow the future commercialization of this uh, potentially transformative therapy. This slide shows the manufacturing process that we are implementing at Marker Therapeutics. It relies on the use of uh, the sample material from the donor or the patient. And we use a combination of uh, peptides that expand the antigens uh, of interest. And in combination with a TH1 cytokines, we can use this in the GRA and expand sufficient cells for administration to patients. Uh, and this strategy, the company is uh, testing initially in our uh, study for patients in AML post-transplant. We call this product MT401, and uh, hopefully very soon in future meetings, we're going to start sharing some of the upcoming results in this clinical study. Um, I think that's basically my introduction and, uh, about the company, so I think that will be back to you, Josh. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Juan. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mamta. I think having that background really helps. Uh, we do not need these slides up anymore. Um, and we'll jump into some questions. So, you know, uh, personally, again, just, just eager and excited here because uh, all three of you have uh, a really strong background in uh, the academic setting uh, and now many years uh, focused on you know, bringing the promise of these therapies um, um, into the in industrial setting and, and treat more patients. So my first question is going to be around kind of this academia versus industry, um, you know, concept and, and, and really would love to hear from, from everyone, what are the biggest differences, surprises or challenges that you have faced uh, when bringing products to the clinic in academia um, versus the private sector. So I'm sure a lot of the challenges are the same, uh, but I'd be really curious to, to drill down on what are the what are the main challenges in either setting, if that makes sense. So maybe I'll I'll, I'll kick this one off um, to you, Mamta, um, and we can kind of go around the horn. So again, 
really looking for those those big challenges and what's really different uh, in academia versus uh, industry. Yes, sure. Uh, so I myself uh, uh, coming from uh, the Baylor College of Medicine and doing process development there. Uh, the biggest cha uh, change that I saw myself moving doing process development here to the process development at Imatix was a really regulated uh, environment. So uh, even the process development work is uh, uh, less of R&D style. There is a documentation and more planning uh, around uh, the work. Uh, uh, so we have um, uh, study plans designed and SOP written, uh, written um, for early work uh, with not so stringent uh, stringency in there, but uh, still documentation becomes an important factor. Um, uh, and then uh, that in, that in, then another big aspect is uh, that small scale plate based studies need to be now viewed with the end in mind that what will be more GMP friendly, what will be uh, more scalable. So right from the beginning, the process development, uh, the mantra that we have been always following is begin with the end in mind. So the reagents that you can use in your PD studies uh, have to be GMP available in GMP uh, compliant platform. Uh, the process can be carried out in a GMP friendly scalable manner. And one thing that we learned um, is that uh, most of the studies in academia uh, is carried out um, uh, with uh, healthy donor material, even in industry, to majority of the process development. However, not all the findings in healthy uh, donors would be applicable to when you we are working with the patients. Uh, so and patient availability material availability for this process development is very limited. So that's one of the challenge uh, to be able to envision if the uh, product quantity and the quality that we see with the healthy donors will be translatable uh, to when we do manufacturing of autologous products uh, from cancer patients. Um, so, uh, in, and in, um, further to that, from small scale plate based cultures, and now our uh, cultures, we have to now understand to be able to deliver for phase one in the clinical uh, trial that we have to uh, envision the handling of bigger cultures, uh, sustainable platforms that can. Uh, that can allow this handling and without introducing an additional risk for contamination. Uh, so all these factors go into the mind. And if I have to pinpoint just one, I would say uh, applicability of the healthy donor data to the patient uh, is an uh, important uh, factor to consider. And maybe before I go, uh to, to Juan on this question. I'm just curious, Monta, how have you or, or how has a Maddox tried to handle that? Are, are there ways to acquire, um, you know, that unhealthy material or is that is that not something that can, you know, readily be, be done in the field? Yes, I mean, this is a continued challenge and we do have a lot of uh, commercial resources now where you can uh, obtain this material. Uh, but um, we have seen the material that you would get will still be in limited quantities. Uh, so, uh, so what we do is we start with the healthy donors and then um, try to validate our findings uh, in some of the patient material. Sounds like a good path. So Juan, what do you think? Biggest challenges there moving um, and, and maybe biggest differences working in the, the academic clinical world versus industry? Well, I mean, I think that the, the academic generation of clinical trials have a very well an established purpose, right? I mean, I think that when you look at early stage clinical trials, you basically are talking about proof of concept, right? And I think with, as long as that is kept as the primary mission, you, you know, you start, you're now able to segregate the differences in terms of the primary purpose of 
an academic sponsor clinical study versus a company sponsor, right? I think that the, with that said, the objective of many academic sponsored clinical trials really focus on phase one or perhaps phase two studies. It's really unusual to see phase three studies being sponsored by academic institutions in many cases because the infrastructure and resources are just not even there to do so, right? So the primary endpoint really is first in man studies and identify whether the, the theory is actually sound, right? And with that said, I think that the FDA actually give a lot of um, uh, a favorable review in terms of uh, you know, access to materials and reagents that although uh, they are appropriate for early stage uh, clinical studies, they might not be appropriate for uh, commercialization, right? And, and I think that in a similar way, there is a reflection in terms of uh, throughput of manufacture, right? I mean, when you think about a clinical study where your endpoint is to manufacture product for 10 patients, well, for even if you don't have the most sophisticated and efficient manufacturing process, you're not going to, uh, that's not going to be your bottleneck, right? Your bottleneck at that point will be, is there a sign of a, a safety, right? And clinical efficacy. Although it's not the primary objective of early stage clinical trials, I think many people now use efficacy or persistence of cells as, as an exploratory endpoint that is really important uh, for even uh, phase one studies. So I think that uh, the, the, the gap is that when you basically now talk about uh, private institutions, whether it's through acquisitions or extensions to continue advancing these this therapies, there is basically a bridge, right, where uh, the process needs to be optimized, right, where reagents need to be replaced, right, and and certainly the the regulatory agencies will expect a, a higher level of um, of scrutiny throughout this particular transition, right. So I think that what I would say is the highest challenge is perhaps the understanding of of the purpose for those two different entities, right? Because the objective is slightly different. And I think that the biggest challenge is perhaps uh, underestimating the gap in between those two uh, environments, right? And I think that it all depends what is your uh, academic uh, partner that has uh, developed that product, right? I think Mamanta said something important is begin from the end, right? So if, if you're working with academic a developer that has a similar mindset and is thinking not about uh, entering to the clinic, but is thinking at the end goal, which is commercial development, perhaps the gap will be shorter. The gap will exist, but that gap will be shorter, right? And I think that that is something that the field has faced, right? It's basically the transition of proof of concept studies in academia that once they go into industry is challenging to basically execute a fast uh, pace precisely because the gap is 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 large right yeah very very helpful thanks Juan Michael would you like to uh, chime in on this topic yeah I would like to uh, so I have the long view uh, just to remind this audience of the 40-year horizon the first cell therapy protocol that I did was a three-page clinical protocol that I wrote myself, and the consent was a surgical consent form that I just filled in that they were going to get cell therapy, and and that was it. That was 40 years ago. So we've come quite a long way in terms of both um, developing cell therapies as academics, but then also making that transition into uh, industry, and. Um, just to remind everybody, the, uh, the primary goal of academics, of course, is to create new knowledge. And uh, the primary job in the company, as uh, both uh, Juan and Mamta mentioned, is to get your therapeutic uh, cell type, whatever it is, uh, not, in, not only into the clinic with proof of concept, but also eventually to registration. And uh, I think that's an interesting challenge because 
in many ways it requires not a divorce from academe, but rather a close partnership, certainly on the clinical side, uh, but also at some of the preclinical side in terms of driving for proof of concept. And I'll just give you an example. Unlike uh, what Mamta was talking about, where she used normal individual cells, our starting material is a patient's tumor. And so essentially all of the tumor that we acquire uh, is coming as excess resection specimen that is not necessary for pathologic evaluation, but rather something that could be used as a starting material to uh, promote T cell growth and expansion. And we have uh, two sources of tumor. One are vendors who have filled the gap to try and identify and provide this material, de-identified material, other than histology. Um, and, and then the second is from academics who also have excess material that are uh, eager to participate in the onlogger that lead up to clinical protocols. Um, I, I should say one other thing, uh, given the 40 year horizon, uh, essentially the regulatory environment has also changed clearly over those years. And even though one could have imagined uh, effectively a much bigger difference between uh, cell therapies being developed in an academic setting versus one in a, a corporate setting, that difference I think is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and the reason is, is that the same rigorous standards that the industry has evolved appear to be ones that are suitable to protect patients and the institutions that are getting these academic cell therapies into patients, and that includes both NIH and universities. And so I think that the differences, although they're still there, are, are going to continue to get smaller and smaller. Um, and I think uh, the biggest issue, and I think um, both Mamta and, and Juan uh, spoke about this, is how to uh, scale appropriately from single one-offs to ones where you can have a process that can be written down, a batch record, something that informs a reasonably well-trained individual to exercise your process in an effective way, whether that's inside your company or with a contract manufacturer. And I think it's absolutely critical that not only we have a way of uh, making that process of driving the batch record and the validation um, in a way where it's as simple as can be, but no simpler for the people who are pract uh, practicing it on our behalf. But also that uh, we have the opportunity to make changes, which is my one of my biggest frustrations right now, uh, once you've locked down your batch record. I think there, there should be some additional fluidity, especially in very early phase development of cell therapies, and then much of the rigor that we've come to appreciate for marketed CAR-Ts or soon, I believe, TIL therapies, um, that there should be an easier way to make, to make uh, changes during the evolution and early phase one development of a, of a process. And I think I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you. I know. Built on that, uh, Michael, I think you highlighted a critical component in the, in the field, right? And is that you feel this duality, right? Because in one hand, there is a, a pressure to, to get into the clinic and lock your process as soon as possible because time is an essence, right? But on the other hand, as a developer, you know that you can do better, right? You know that you can continue improving the process. And at one point, you basically have to say, okay, enough, let's do it here. But at that point, that continued change that you described is then much harder to continue incorporating, right? And, and I think that, the, that what you highlight is, is critical, right? I think that as the regulatory agencies also evolve and learn more about this, which is still early, right? I think it would be ideal for that early transition to be more uh, organic, right? And allow a more natural evolution, especially for early stage clinical studies, because uh, it would allow the therapist to develop much faster, right? And I think that that's one of the critical areas that I also see, right, is uh, that 
constant conflict of when to basically do the change or lock your process and then sequence subsequent uh, evolutions of it with the, with the knowledge that, that that could have subsequent impact in, in the clinical study, right? And, and I think that the, the, the question of whether those changes impact your biological final product and whether those changes will have significant effects on your clinical performance are things that people basically will lose a sleep over, right? So I think that um, that's something that is really, really important at the moment to better understand and hopefully have a better fluidity in that transition as you described. And maybe yes, I could just follow up with one comment. So thank you for for extending uh, the argument, I think perhaps more elegantly than I did one, uh, which is uh, to say that there was a push, as I understand it, at the FDA to try and enable uh, process improvements to be made a little bit more facilely, especially in early phase development. And I was counting on that. You know, I heard about it first about a year ago when I was visiting the University of Pennsylvania with our CEO. And yet I don't think they fully implemented it yet. And I, I do think it's something we should uh, work together to try in early phase. And practically, as now uh, somebody uh, driving these efforts inside Nurex, much of the innovation that we all know we can bring to ourselves and to our processes has to be done early because of this drive to lock down your process, to drive it into registration. So um, unfortunately, it accelerates our timelines in a way that uh, makes it really critical that you ask solid, good, answerable questions that can modify your process. And then one last comment, I think it's fair to say my last cell therapy company uh, because we were working with a contract manufacturer and we weren't getting enough cells. I said, well, just double the number of flasks. That took six months to make that change at our contract manufacturer. And it's just that kind of silliness cannot persist. It's too hard. It's, there are patients waiting for therapies that are going to help them. And, and this kind of nonsense has to has to evolve in a much more effective way, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think that one of the things that I see, especially seeing both elements like academia and private sector, in academia, I think it's a lot easier sometimes to incorporate these changes, right? But in private sector, I think Manta even mentioned the, the record keeping and documentation and everything has to be done in a certain way. But that reflection of it is basically what you mentioned, Michael, right? Where basically even doubling your production is a small thing, but the implementation of it sometimes can take a long time, right? Because, uh, and it shouldn't be like that, right? And I think that hopefully as we learn more, the critical elements within the process, people will be able to move much faster instead of basically taking this long, long road, which don't really help patients ultimately, correct? Yeah, I think kind of bringing this back to this idea of, of scaling up, um, you know, and, and, and this challenge that's that's very real. Uh, and, and I love the, the begin at the end mindset of Amatics. I think the field can benefit from everybody having that mindset. And and to, to Michael's point, you know, it's not a divorce from academia to industry. It has to be a marriage. And we and whoever you partner with and hopefully the entire, you know, uh, academic clinical field is, is also starting to realize if, if they want to have that true impact, they do need to begin at the end. They need to choose the platforms that they're going to, to use for their cells. They need to choose the reagents that can be the same uh, in that R&D setting. To your point, mom, to where you have protocols now written out and defined processes from very early experiments. So whatever you use on the front end of that R&D work has to be flexible um, as you then scale up and, and, and look to, to then basically the current situation where you really have to walk in your process early. So kind of kind of going on from that, you know, and, and thinking about this idea of um, how the industry might see this or, or, or overcome this challenge. Do you think the industry has arrived at a state where the true value of a manufacturing process that is simple and repeatable 
Do you think that's understood that true value? You know, I, I, I'm hearing all of these, you know, comments about how difficult it is and you lock in and you can't change. You can't even double the amount of flasks. Maybe that's a different discussion about outsourced uh, versus uh, controlling your own manufacturing. Uh, but does the field truly value uh, or understand the value of a simple manufacturing process? What, what do you think, Mamta? So, so simple and repeatable. I think that is ideal. Every would like to keep that, but we also have to deal with the reality uh, that especially for autologous material that each patient uh, is a different biological entity. So there is uh, a push towards having a process which is simple, robust, reproducible, uh, but we have to tackle it or balance it with the variability that comes with the material. So uh, I believe um, there the two aspects that can be used to make uh, the process robust is also to focus on the raw material that's being used. Uh, so it's not only the process, what goes into the process ma matters equally. Uh, so raw material um, and one of the uh, factors that us and others uh, in the field are working on, on how to reduce the variability, the patient to patient variability. Of course, allogeneic is a separate field, you have healthy donors, their variability is not as big of an issue from a batch to batch or from dose to dose. But for autologous therapies, this is um, a big challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, for as we move from in the different stages of clinical development, um, the biggest, uh, uh, I would say, the task is to peel these layers of variability out of the process uh, from uh, raw material to harmonizing the leukophoresis process with uh, the parameters at different sites, and, and then maybe doing some kind of enrichment or section that you're starting with uh, the same population, although uh, to some extent the phenotype of the cells would still be different. And now then removing the variability um, uh, that introduces into your uh, processes like the moving away from serum to serum-free media, lot-to-lot -lot variation, and all those things have to add up and accumulate at every step uh, for the uh, industry's uh, ideal, uh, I would say, robust and reproducible process. Uh, so it is an ongoing work and a, um, a continued challenge, which uh, with recent developments we have tried to overcome, uh, uh, but it remains the challenge nonetheless for autologous therapies. Yeah, I think there's there there's really still a lot to be understood and, and a lot to maybe be um, um, so solidified as an industry, both from the tools using and, and the raw materials coming in. Um, you know, as as the continued growth of research and and commercial efforts in this field, you know, continues and 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 critical materials come under stress, kind of as we've seen with uh, lentivirus, right? As the field has seen, you know, what what aspects of the manufacturing process do you maybe see as the most risky? Maybe I'll, I'll direct this uh, to you, Juan. And 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 are there ways to frame this around? You know, can is it important to start reducing the cell quantities, starting cell quantities needed within a process, or reducing media requirements, uh, or or reducing viral vector requirements? You know, again, knowing that. This field is, is going to continue to grow and more and more groups are coming into the space using the same, you know, reagents and raw materials. How do you how do you begin at the end and 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 work with materials that are going to scale with your company and scale with the industry? Hmm. I'm gonna answer your question, Josh, Josh, by first ask, answering a different question, right? So if you have to bear with me for a moment go ahead so i think that before we can even launch into understanding that mechanics box aspect of it like how to optimize a process 
I think what becomes really critical is to understand the biology of the therapy itself, right? I mean, I think that that's a paramount component that really builds the foundation for any process improvement, right? So I think that the, the critical and most important thing is to understand the key biological attributes of the therapy that you're developing, right? And I think that that is a very aspirational uh, statement, right? Because I, uh, the field is still learning what aspects are actually important, right? But, but nevertheless, we have to make a best attempt to understand and put parameters in place to do uh, the best that we can do to characterize the product, right? Using analytical components right, that are far beyond cell quantity and viability, right? You're talking about qualitative aspects of it, right? Cell function, cell phenotype. And using those as anchors, when you can at least put a framework and say, okay, this is what I consider are the key biological attributes. And once you have a good foundation on that aspect, I think that you can start doing the work that you refer to, right? In a safer manner. Because I, I guess the difficult thing is manufacturing large number of cells is quite easy. Manufacture, manufacturing a large number of cells while preserving or improving those attributes is challenging. But I think that it, you need to start from that basic of it. And then as you, in a gradual and systematic manner, incorporate those changes, it becomes easy to know whether you're going in the right direction or not and correct at the appropriate time. So maybe with that, I, I go in silence and, and see some of my analyst colleagues, yeah, see what they think. So can I extend that again, uh, given the gracious opportunity from one? Josh, OK? Please. So, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, all of us having come through COVID-19, or hopefully we're coming through it now, uh, that the power of immunology is really quite apparent, not only in uh, immunotherapy of uh, viral diseases, but also uh, of oncologic diseases. And here you have two extraordinarily complex biologic systems, the cancer itself, you know, with um, one to 50 coding mutations per megabase of DNA, so 3,000 to 150,000 mutations, and then a T-cell repertoire and B-cell repertoire that far exceeds in terms of its ability to generate diversity, uh, the number of cells you can carry around in your own body. You know, you're only about 10 to the 13th cells, and you can make 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 25th different T cells with a mind-boggling amount of variation, not only in their um, CDR3s, but also in their biologic functions. And I think Juan is correct, is that the closer we can come to measuring and assessing the varieties of T cells in particular in their ability to manifest this great uh, variation, the closer we'll get to more effective understanding of the therapeutics uh, we're trying trying to uh, develop. And I think if you look uh, at the traditional measures, which is cell number, uh, viability, uh, we have to go way beyond that. And I think the agency is looking for that, what's something they call potency assays, that we have to define what that means. We have to say here is when we give cells to patients, here is what we qualify as their critical characteristics that we know what we're giving is what we're giving and we can do it over and over again in a meaningful way. And I think that's, that is a big challenge for the field uh, to define what those potency assays are and what are meaningful differences, not just ones for marketing but meaningful differences that pay off in terms of patient care. And everybody in my shop knows that I said, till tumor infiltrating lymphocytes took 35 years to get where they are. We don't have that kind of horizon, you know, particularly when you're in a company to have 35 years to do that kind of continuous process improvement. We're gonna have to find better ways to measure ourselves and define what are the critical elements. There's one other issue I'd like to bring up, and I don't know whether I'm jumping the queue, and that is if you look at virtually any complex disease, whether it be an infectious disease like chronic diseases like TB or rheumatoid arthritis, 
or uh, other autoimmune disorders or uh, graft versus host and host versus graft, but certainly cancer, single agent therapies just don't exist. And so one of the things that we're going to have to grapple with is how do we integrate uh, other elements of conventional therapeutics, small molecules, um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, cytokines, and how can we do that in a meaningful way in dialogue with the regulatory groups and even our own internal groups? Because the quality and nature of the process you're putting in that has to be regulated is going to be changed estimably by other things that you bring to the table. And I think that's a, a substantial challenge uh, for the industry. Um, and one last issue, uh, I don't think about it all that much uh, until recently, uh, but the idea of immunogenicity. In other words, another buzzword for the regulatory groups is how do we know that the cells or the associated agents that we're providing don't elicit an immunogenic response in the host. And I think that's going to be a challenge we're going to have to grapple with as this field matures and goes forward. And I, I think I'll just pause now. Josh, can I uh, add? I just uh, want to uh, say I very much uh, agree with Juan's point of view that it's uh, it's uh, critical to know the characteristics, desired characteristics of your product, and then keeping we call them a target product profile. Uh, so we establish it upfront. Uh, that this is what we want to look the product to look at the end and then that serves as uh, a benchmark that you are trying to uh, do the pro if you're trying to develop the process then that is the benchmark that you are trying to achieve um, with that target product profile in mind uh, so uh, and to your point um, uh, regarding the vectors uh, we do con uh, vectors or other raw materials, less media or less starting material. All of these are important uh, factors and for um, autologous therapies uh, to scale out and um, and then uh, everything else has to be scaled up and we all in the field acknowledge uh, the risk of uh, uh, risk of limited availability of the lentiviruses that has become one of the uh, uh, bottleneck uh, in the field and therefore development of other technologies like non-viral vectors or um, or uh, uh, could be helpful in overcoming those uh, uh, bottlenecks. It's, it's, this lies not only to the viral vectors, but uh, important vector also in your uh, process as you scale up and scale out and to realize uh, the whole picture and commercialization uh, is to maintain a healthy supply uh, of these material, critical raw materials. So it's very, very important to either reduce, uh, to work on reducing the need of these critical components uh, or trying to find alternatives that are more sustainable over years to come. I completely agree and I, I appreciate everybody's comments there. And I think maybe to summarize really what I heard was you know, defining these critical quality attributes beyond just the basic um, um, cell number and, and, and viability is, is, is basically paramount, uh, both in the academic setting and then, of course, in industry. But that's kind of where academia can help speed up the progress of the field, maybe, if they had a better characterization of these cells. So you can look back and say, while we might be changing the process to, to further simplify and make this manufacturable at scale, um, we are not changing the, the critical quality attributes or we're not uh, lowering the effect that they're going to have on, on the patient uh, uh, once you administer them. So defining that, um, which is going to do so many things, but help the FDA give, give kind of their blessing as, as you make changes and you prove to them that your cells are the same or maybe better, uh, depending on kind of the change that's being made. But it would give industry the ability to 
to further innovate and simplify uh, as, as new technology comes out, but also tie that back then, you know, Juan, something you brought up, you've treated 150 patients uh, in, in the academic setting at Baylor or more with, with kind of the marker process. So how do you, you know, those, those attributes, not only the outcomes, but that's how you need to tie that, um, uh, you need to tie the current manufacturing and, and, and data back to those uh, uh, early studies in academia. If, if I may, because we're, we're, we're running short on time, uh, and I'm sure this will, will, will go quick, but a couple points that I want to make. I would love to hear, um, you know, we've talked a lot about scale up and, and eager to also focus on what happens when we're successful at scale out. And so I'll, I'll maybe ask this question, how have you thought about managing capacity um, a, as a company, internal, external combination? Would be curious to hear that. And again, because we're running out of time, maybe a, you know, a, a final forward-looking thought put on your your soothsayer hat. Uh, I know Michael has a few of those. Uh, where do you see the industry, um, you know, going in the next, you know, five to ten years? What's going to be that big trigger point? So, would love to hear managing capacity at success. How are each of your companies planning for that? And then, and then, if you have a thought about where the industry is headed, would be curious to get that as well. So why don't we start with uh, Michael? So if I heard uh, correctly, there were two major questions, Josh. One is, how are we dealing with going from just a couple of patients per month out to a successful uh, ramping up to large numbers of patients, both in terms of <coughs> excuse me, sequestration of products in a limited uh, facility. How do you make sure that you can keep track of individual patient uh, materials? And then when is the crossover point? When do you want to go from a contract manufacturer uh, that you're using to bringing it all in-house and running your own manufacturing capabilities, I think, are, are critical issues. And then uh, looking out uh, five to ten years, um, I don't think anybody can look five to ten years. I think maybe, uh, given how quick the world changes, maybe three years might be a better horizon and leave the ten years for the real soothsayers better than me. So in terms of the first part, one of the things I've noticed is that this uh, effort to limit your investment in bricks and mortar in order to build your own manufacturing capability, especially as our processes get simpler to, uh, to do, uh, has become an increasing liability and less of a plus. I mean, I think it's good to start up, but I think having full control of your own process uh, internally, uh, what I'm seeing from a lot of cell therapy companies is that they're bringing it in-house earlier than what I would have thought uh, would be the case. And I think it's it largely comes down to um, having control. And, and I think we're going to see people moving in that direction more and more, especially since they're planning on success and getting their cell therapies uh, to the market. Um, and since I trimmed your five to 10 year uh, horizon to three years, um, I want to have a registered product in three years that is suitably uh, mature, that it can be coupled uh, with investigator initiated protocols and so on with other agents that will be helped in part supported by our company and perhaps others. Because I think getting these as almost building blocks out there where people can discover how to best apply them it's going to require a much bigger footprint than just a single uh, patient target and a single cell therapy. And it'll be interesting to watch how that emerges uh, three to five years hence. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Mamta. What, um, how is how is Amatics planning for success? And, and any thoughts on the on the kind of near near long term here, three years? Right, so uh, 
Well, we are still in the planning phase and it's all discussions. Um, you know, there are two models. We can do centralized manufacturing and make, uh, like uh, Mike mentioned, that um, uh, bringing it in house completely uh, helps uh, having that control, the efficiency, maintenance of uh, uh, patient product pipeline is easier. Uh, so, uh, however, it also depends on uh, uh, the geograph geographical location of your sites. If we are global, like Ematics has clinical trials uh, here in US and in Germany uh, now, and if we want to go from now uh, Europe to Asia, to, if if we keep that in mind, it could be a hybrid system where you have uh, for one location your own manufacturing, whereas for others there are you are working with CDMO. So um, I would suggest it, it depends on uh, uh, both the factors and how to balance uh, the patient uh, supply chain globally in the end. Thank you. Juan, any final thoughts? Yeah, I think that in, in this particular aspect, simplification is key, right? I think that you want to bring your process to the minimum elements and that will solve your problem of throughput and facility. At Marker, we have actually um, bring that in-house. We have our own manufacturing facility at Houston. And the way that I will see this going forward, or the challenge that we have forward, is we're setting up a simplified manufacturing process, but thinking not just about a registration, but uh, Manta started the conversation talking about finishing from the end. And I would like to say to that, that our end is a commercial success, right? And I think when you think in that sort of terms, having a simple, robust manufacturing process will be the key for success at a commercial scale, right? And I think that that way will be the way that will characterize the horizon for us in the next uh, three years. And I know we're running out of time, Josh, uh, so I will close with that. Well, I, I really appreciated everybody. I think uh, it further solidified, you know, my excitement for our, our recently launched joint venture scale ready to tackle a lot of those problems with scale up and, and simplifying the manufacturing process. And I really appreciate uh, each of you joining me here today. Uh, with that, I'll kick it back to David in the studio. Thank you very much. Indeed. And uh, yes, th thank you to Mamta, Juan, Michael, and of course, Josh for uh, that panel session. Some really strong feelings, some really strong opinions on, on what, what needs to be done to get um, uh, treatments to patients as quickly as possible. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Up next uh, on the network track is a speed networking session designed to help you start those all important business conversations that you can carry on throughout the event. If you join the session, you'll be matched with three attendees for a five minute meeting each and the team will, deploy, will be deploying its AI platform to match you with those participants that you'll be most likely to be interested in meeting. Uh, and of course, after this, we'll be back here for clinical updates from Cellularity and Windmill Therapeutics. So don't go away. See you back shortly. <laughs>